I do. Oh, there you go. Nice. All right. What's going on, Common Law Rights Society? My name is Greg Ward, your host, and we have a very, very, very special guest tonight, Mr. Mark Stevens from uh, markstevens.net and Adventures in Legal Land and uh, the famous uh, No State Project that uh, we've all heard so much about. And you guys have been watching online and seeing all the fantastic stories of the people. Mark's been uh, part of the law movement for a very long time. Welcome, Mr. Mark Stevens. How's it going tonight, brother? Uh, it's going well. Uh, glad to be here, Paisan. <laughs> nice. And we, uh, we share a, a Long Island uh, history. We both uh, were born in Long Island, right? I was not born on Long Island. I was actually born in Chictawaga, but I lived for 25 years. Ah. I grew up on Long Island, so that's what's important. <laughs> well, we had a... Uh, you probably have more experience than I, I. I moved out of there when I was in fourth grade and went to uh, New Jersey, but I knew that oh. we had some Long Island. <laughs> well, was I think you mentioned a Massapequa. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I actually bought a 1970 Cougar in Massapequa. Nice. How to do? How to do for you? Uh, it, it got us to see. Uh, <laughs> we saw Stevie Ray Vaughan with Joe Satriani at the pier in Manhattan. And we hit a pothole so deep on the way back, I broke a leaf spring. So amazingly <laughs> enough, we made it back from, from, uh, from New York City to back. I lived in Selden. I grew up in Selden. Oh, wow. That sounds like a story I had coming out of New York City. Uh, I hit a pothole so big it popped my tire. That's not too bad. I mean, I, you know, you can change the tire, but you're not changing leaf spring. I said, what? So we had to get everybody to the other, you know, on one side of the car. Oh my God. So that, you know, <laughs> it didn't actually blow my tire out on the way home. So yes, it took a long time to get home because I did, if I was going to have a blowout, I didn't want it to be at uh, 65 miles an hour. No doubt. No doubt. So what's, uh, what's been going on, Mark? What's been going on in, the, in your world? You know, I, I've been busy with tax stuff, not IRS stuff, because, you know, it turns out, you know, the whole shutdown, there's nobody there. Yeah. But like I mentioned on the show yesterday, I spoke uh, about some interesting uh, uh, responses or non-responses that I was getting from a couple of agents. And uh, I had one, I, you know, look, and I mentioned, look, man, I, look, when I'm talking about this, to me, it's, I'm not personally, I don't hate these people. I don't, right. you know, think that it, some of them are, yeah, but I, I don't go into it that way. And, and I do my best to avoid coming across like an arrogant scumbag who, who, so I got accused. So I, I I'm just pulling apart an argument. I, I don't care about their personal life. They, I, you know, I treat them with respect and I'm just pulling apart the argument. But when your life is so entwined with that, when that argument is actually a part of your, you know, your personality, uh, it's tough to, uh, you know, to not come across like you're attacking the person. So I had this tax agent when I asked for facts to support her conclusion or her opinion that the laws applied because my client's property was physically in California. Uh, she said, I don't know. And then, you know, some other, you know, white noise, you know, that wasn't, you know, relevant to, you know, didn't answer the question at all. So when I went back and I asked her if I don't know was a strong argument or position to be taking against my client, she jumped down my throat saying, well, if you're just going to nitpick everything I say, every word, I'm like, first, no, that's not what I was doing. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. You're that fine. was very unprofessional there. I no, forgot fine. to turn the I forgot to turn the volume down on that. So I do apologize. Uh, give me a moment. And, uh, You're absolutely I'm very fine. new. I'm I'm very new to using phones, so <laughs> that that's why. So I'm gonna. Uh, we're good to go. <laughs> well, I've done you, it in my own show, and I should know better. <laughs> but you you bring up a good point, anyway, huh? and I think people you uh, know who who are new to video lock up. Um, you still there? Okay, I was, I'm sorry. We got, uh, I don't know which end that is. Yeah, yeah, you froze up for a second. Oh, oh okay, because yeah, I saw that yours did. So anyway, I apologize for that. So uh, so that's one of the things that, that's been going on. Uh, I gotcha. So far today. Well, well, you know, to those who um, who are new to watching you, and I think, um, to be honest, I think most of the folks in the law research uh, you know, I mean, 
group of folks who are, are lay people who are doing research in the law. They know they know they want to either they're in trouble and they're trying to figure out is there a way uh, that they can maybe do better than with than with a lawyer or just trying to figure out the history of things. And so people start researching, they come across you. Um, but those who haven't, um, what's, what stuck out in my mind in your, with your argument was you go to the root of things, right? Because a, a lot of these, uh, as you said, the, the, whether it be a tax case or this case or that case, you just go straight to the root of it. And you ask them to plainly show you the facts that, and how it applies to you. And would tell, tell the folks what, 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 what do you usually get as an answer? Well, I don't always get, I don't know, <laughs> which, you know, uh, would, would help, sim you know, ease things somewhat. Uh, but uh, there, and, and, and going to the root, I, I, get, I agree, you know, you want to strike the root, you know, you, I have people who are paying me to help resolve these problems. And, and so it, it, uh, it, it's in my interest and their interest, of course, to, especially mine, I, want to, I, I don't want to add to the damage that's being done because they have to pay me. Uh, more than is necessary. So I want to strike right at the root exactly. So what I want to do is I want to find out what is the foundational claim? What is the very foundation on which the uh, zoning official relies on or the police officer or the tax agent that we, you know, we're talking about a county tax assessment. Mm -hmm. and, and I have found it's exactly the same thing, whether we're in the United States, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's all based on the same claim. So Whatever who, whoever's attacking you for whatever reason, the same foundational claim is always, and I've got plenty of examples on the website for this, including there uh, with the uh, Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. So uh, it's always, if you're physically in X, so let's say it's Arizona, Florida, New Zealand, uh, then their laws apply. Right. You know, they, they call it territorial jurisdiction for a reason. I know there's a few trolls that don't like that, but uh, that's what it comes down to. Right. And once I find that out, all I have to do is destroy the foundation. So if I can knock the foundation out, then the whole house of cards falls down. Because uh, for those who may not be aware, when you're talking about things in the legal realm, relevance is really, really important. And so whether I have pot, is not relevant if they haven't been able to prove the foundational claim that their laws apply because I'm physically in Arizona. So it's a, that's why you'll see or you'll hear me say so often on these phone calls, whatever they come out with, that's not relevant. Let's just focus on the first part. When you say that's not relevant, you mean their, their, their claim itself, like you broke this law? Well, it'll, let's say that you had pot or you didn't have a driver's license or you didn't, you didn't, the big one that I work with is either a driver's license and uh, you didn't file a return. And whether or not I filed a return, it may, you know, between, oh uh, yeah, factually it's accurate. Let's just say the fact, but those facts are not relevant to the conversation until you can first demonstrate why, why it's relevant. Because if you can't show that the rules are applicable, right. then any potential violate or alleged violation that is completely irrelevant. And that's why when you go into court and you're talking about the prosecution putting on a case or the defense putting on a case, people, lawyers are correctly taught you have to build your case. So if you've got a sophisticated like you know uh, complaint or an action sort of like like medical malpractice you you have to be able to provide the information uh, to the jury in a manner that shows the relevance so if you just come out with a bloody knife it's it's not admissible at that if you just present that first right. you have to have the background to show why it's relevant to proving the proposition and just a bloody knife all on its own may probably doesn't prove your proposition. Right. So I say that the, the police officer and, and they'll admit this, the police officer or the revenue agent, they are saying the laws apply to you. In my opinion, the laws apply to you and you violated it. So there's two part, parts to that. I focus on the first one because it sets the relevance for the, for the second one. And they want you and I to just assume part one. And I refuse to do that. And I think it's silly to do that. No, I completely 100% agree with you. 
Um, one of the things that we say on this channel a lot is law and logic, right? You have to have, and if you want to have law, law is not just magical. It doesn't appear out of thin air. As you said, uh, it's not uh, like, you know, when you go to your, your dad when you were young and he says, because I said so, that doesn't go in law. There has to be, as you said, a foundation of how it applies to you. That's all we're asking. If this is, is it, if this is what is claimed to be a government by the consent of the governed, that's what they claim. So that yeah. there has to, so if, if, if they use that word consent, then there's a contractual relationship or there's the lack thereof. That's, and that's for, 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 for me, when you start looking at logic, when it comes to these things, as, as you said, how does it apply to me? You're saying that you're, you're a fictional entity called the state, right? It didn't exist forever. It was, it, cre it was created by man. So how is this man-made creation, this so-called state, this so-called government, how are these rules that you're claiming apply to me? How do they apply? And what? sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I agree with what you're saying as far as though when we're, when we're actually engaging them, it's not even necessary to say all that. So if you go and you listen to a lot of the call of shames, when I'm speaking to the agents, uh, I want to get right to the heart of the matter. I want to know what their claim is so that I can start applying the Socratic method and just ask questions to deconstruct it and see why they think and if they can actually verify it. So I don't get into, so I don't get into a lot of that. It's great for a discussion between us or some other people. Uh, but when we're actually engaging with with bureaucrats and agents of the you know the the, the government this criminal organization uh it i think it's it's more effective to just to instead of getting into that stuff which can get you into other areas right. discussion where it, it just it, it doesn't keep us on the relevant point if if you just go and i this is what i do i ask them so you your office operates under the presumption that if i'm physically in arizona your laws apply and i'll say well yeah so without even discussing who they represent, the state, the government, whatever, we get right to the heart of the matter. Mm. Because if they can't show that, which they can't, then just like what I've done before, and, uh, and uh, where if, if a prosecutor does claim to represent the state, yes, I ask him for proof. I don't say, well, that's a fictional entity. I just ask him for proof. So you keep, I'm a big firm believer in keeping the burden of proof on the one who's making the claim, which is why I tend not to spend much time on those things. So if they say, why wouldn't this, the, the, the laws of the state apply within the state? I was like, well, what do you mean by state? Are you talking about the ground? Are you talking about the political body? What, what are you talking? I don't, I don't think, you know, in my experience anyway, I don't, and it's not being a douche. I hope it doesn't come across that way. I'm not going to supply them with any additional material. If I don't have to, I mean, I'll ask a leading question, but I will leave as much material out as, 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 as necessary to just get to the heart of the matter, which is they're just men and women forcing us to pay them. And everything else is window dressing, including saying, well, it's not me. It's the state. It's just like in uh, happy Gilmore. I'm not taking your stuff. The government is, but you are taking my stuff. <laughs> I think you make some good, great points. Um, you know, I, I visited in this, in the Skype uh, rooms that, you know, uh, that people discuss your um, Socratic method. They call it the, the Markratic method over there. <laughs> and, and, and I thought it was funny when I first began getting involved in discussing with some of these guys, you find that they're very cut and dry. Some of them, and they'll, t and they'll say exactly what you're saying in their own words. Uh, don't make claims. And it took me a while to, to, to be able to digest that and, and to not feel, as you said, like, oh, man, this guy's coming at me so strong. You know, and, and, but I got, you know, because a lot of times as we study this quote unquote law, we find that, oh, well, this, you might have things that so-called reveal to you. You're like, oh, that makes sense. So you bring it up to these groups. Hey, what about this? Or, hey, I just discovered this and this what seem, it seems like is going on. And right away they said, hey, you know what I mean? I, I, I try to remember some of the ways that they would say it, but they'd always, you know, I mean, cut me off immediately. And they say, you know, you're making claims. You, you know, you, you basically what you're saying, you're giving more ammo, you're giving 
conversation that doesn't even need to take place because if you go at that route, everything else is irrelevant. Well, and I think what the guys are trying to do is because they're, they're focused more on helping people actually engage the bureaucrats in court or during an attack. And, right. and, and, and that's kind of a blinder thing on there. And, 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 and it's, and you're going against professional litigators. These people are cretins. They're bottom feeders. I, 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 hey, I'm with you there. <laughs> But we don't want to underestimate them. And, and they're going to treat you 100 times worse than the guys do or I would on, on the chat. Uh, I have said you got to, you know, with newbies, new people who are new, you got to understand that they are under attack. Don't add to any more stress. You know, you don't want to do that. You know, you, you make the point and, and some of the things that come up are very interesting. I mean, there's somebody that sent me uh, who's on the show and, and he, I, I can't believe for a second the claims that he's making uh, as far as no laws were actually ever passed. And he's got State Department documents that actually prove and support his claim that no law, federal laws have ever been passed. It's all fake. And yet, at the same time, he is sending me court documents where he has gotten more than a few uh, uh, cases to kicked out. He's got documentary proof of prosecutors withdrawing charges against him. Huh. So, you, you know, I, I still have to investigate. Now, I, my stuff is under the same, the same criticism. Uh, some of the stuff that, where I've posted may not have had to do with my defense. And I accept that. Sure, the cop didn't show up and, you know, may not, and, and, but I, I accept that. Sure. That there is a plausible alternative explanation. So I don't know. And I haven't seen the actual documents. So, so you know, it, 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 it's worth investigating when someone has documentary proof. I'll investigate when I have the time. Sure. So people shouldn't be immediately shot down. It should be, uh, this is interesting, not something we would put in an actual defense if we're being attacked. Because when you're being attacked, uh, you don't want to give them any ammunition, ammunition. And you certainly, you know, you don't want the prosecution to have any, uh, any time out of the spotlight. And 100% of our attention should be on destroying the presumption of correctness the prosecution may enjoy from the judge. And so that's why we're focused 100% on did the prosecution present the evidence? And so if we make an assertion, other than the prosecution has no evidence, they're going to run with it. And, and they'll, they're professional litigators. Most people are not that we're working with, and they will eat you alive. Once they get you off point, most people are not going to be able to bring it back. Yeah, that make a very good point. <clears throat> um, yeah, on, on, this, on this show, you know, we discuss a lot of uh, some of those finer details in examining them and, and, and not always necessarily knowing that it's accurate in how our, the interpretation is, but you start to see a, a breadcrumb trail of evidence. Um, you start looking at Roman civil law and how it might've came over into um, America and then using different, you know, these different jurisdictions in rem jurisdiction, the use of the, the person, the legal person, the fiction, all these different things. And it's fascinating when you start examining the, these things and you, again, you start realizing the quote unquote evil genius of how maybe this system is applied against the people. Um, but I, I, again, I, it, it took me a while. Um, I, I discussed it with a lot of people and I had a, a, a a little template of a transcript, right, as in a courtroom. And when I started looking through it, it was using the Marcratic method, the Socratic method. And I said, man, this is really amazing. And, and it was basically exactly like you said, um, and tell me if this would be a correct way of presenting it. Um, the prosecution says what he says, and, the, and so you say, um, judge, may I ask a question? And uh, you say, uh, is, it, is it the prosecution's job to prove every element of the crime? Yes, yes, sir, it is. And is jurisdiction an element of the crime? Uh, yes, sir, it is. And has the prosecution provided any actual facts to, to substantiate the presumption that uh, basically that the law is applied to me? And 
I, th I mean, to me, that that was the way it was written out in this particular script. And I don't know if that if there's anything that you would correct to that, or if, or if you would approach it differently. Well, the script is not to be read in court, and I make that clear to people who get the script, and I have the instructions with it. The script is a is a teaching tool, so that you when you role play, you you don't have to rely. You should have it there in case you know you get, you know, you know, stressed. I didn't, mean, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean having in court. I meant having that memorized as far as asking the judge this and then leading him down a line of questioning. But, it, but even memorizing it, what, what, what the script is doing, what we're doing with the role playing is to solidify your understanding and proficiency with the tactic of using uh, uh, leading questions and keeping the, you know, to ask uh, the prosecution, the judge or the witness uh, leading questions to bring out contradictions and admissions like, I don't know. Uh, it, is, it is to train you so that regardless of what kind of response you get, you will have the, the, the experience, the intu intuitiveness to be able to respond appropriately. So I mentioned on a show yesterday, look, you, when you're talking about leading questions, which for those who aren't aware, only allowed on cross-examination, by the way, uh, mm -hmm you are putting the information in the question, thereby influencing the testimony of the witness because you're supplying the information. And it's not allowed on direct examination except on a very limited circumstances. So that's why you'll see on TV, they'll say, your honor permission to treat the witness as hostile. So that's a prosecution witness who's being difficult and once they've established that they're hostile, then they get to ask leading questions. But that's an extraordinary situation. Hmm. Uh, and so, I mentioned yesterday that, that how and why questions are particularly powerful leading kind of questions that you're asking. And so uh, if you understand and you know about leading questions and you've done it before, regardless of the crap that comes out of the mouth of the witness, the prosecutor or the judge, you will be able to take a moment and formulate a really good response. Because the biggest, a big thing of the tactic here, Greg, is to always assume that what the prosecution is saying is a lie. And so my job is to object and have them verify it. So that's why I mentioned earlier, it's kind of tough to not come across as an arrogant scumbag because you are holding someone to their burden, which is your job when you go in to defend yourself or for the defense attorney. And you're going, and I, look, you're in the fight sometimes for your life. It yeah. could change the course of, of your life. And so you have to be very diligent. And yes, I will have somebody verify what they're saying. It even annoys regular listeners to my show when they call in and they have a disagreement. And I'll sit back. There's no ire here. I'm not pissed off. Uh, and uh, I just ask leading questions and have them verify what they're saying. So one of the things came up, it was a thing about immigration. And Tom's been on the show many times. And he's had a lot of success in court. Uh, which is great and not so much success. All, you know, he's good and bad. Mm -hmm. And he made a, a claim about immigrants. And I just wanted him to be specific. I, you know, it's just like when we go into court, you absolutely cannot accept a generalization from them. You have to object and have them be specific. And, and that annoys some people. But I think especially when we're in court, we have to do that. So again, the script is not to be memorized other than the tactics that we're using. We're assuming that they're lying at every step of this way. We're going to always go from generalizations to something more specific. So the vague to the specific and bring out contradictions. We're going to do it by asking leading questions. And what are some of our best leading questions? How and why? So when they say stupid things that the driver's license is evidence the laws apply, you object and say, how so? And I'm telling you that, that you get these bewildering looks because imagine you being being ca careless enough to say that the Constitution proves the laws apply. I mean, that the driver's license proves the laws apply. Now you're in the hot spot. Great. How so? How does that work? Explain to me. I'll cut you a check right now, tough guy. And and that's the that's you you that you've when you get to that point, you've hit your objective because there's no getting out of that. All they're going to do is snap at you, threaten contempt, or say they don't have to prove. <laughs> How often do you feel like um, they back down? 
most of the time they will withdraw. They most of the time uh, better than 50. It's always been better than 50% of the time. Uh, we're having something tossed out again. There are alternate uh, explanations sure. for a lot of for some of them We have to allow for that. We want to be rational Well, and it could that be co coincidence that he didn't show up because you were presenting these arguments that they didn't want to Hey, why don't you stay home cop? <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah it, it could be that they have a heavy docket and it just wasn't worth prosecuting I that's what I think is the case with this guy who is saying and he's got the proof I can't argue with the denial it looks real. Mm. Uh, I think it's a case of, I don't even want to deal. You know, it's a heavy docket. We don't need to do this. And, and that happens. I think it's, I'm not taken away and trying to piss on the guy's success. I think it's great whenever something gets, gets sourced out and so that they don't get to uh, put someone in jail or take a large chunk of money and time from them. Uh, it's just, but we have to, it, it, you know, but I, I have reports more than a few reports, Greg, where uh, people have said, no, the cop, who wrote me the ticket was at the court. He, they just said he wasn't there for my case. Wow. Oh, you know, under, and, and under those circumstances, yeah, yeah. So I, I like to apply the but for standard. And if we do that to my cases as well as to this other individual's cases, and, and, and he doesn't have, he's got for himself, yeah, he's got like six mm. uh, in, in like 12, 15 years, which is fantastic. Um, so if we say, but for, would they have thrown this out, but for the defense he put up when we've got two options, we've already said it could be just a heavy docket, or it could be, they accepted that there was merit and didn't want to prosecute it. Right. Uh, my material, I don't think I'm necessarily biased in a bad way, but I can show you the logic and I can show you a Supreme court chief justice who in front of the entire, you know, in front of the. ASU Law School in Tempe, uh, Tempe, Arizona, it's on HD video, when confronted to prove that the laws apply, what evidence, the only thing he could say was that they put other people in prison. So I know my position has merit. I, it's right. logical. I've tested it. And I've confronted judges and prosecutors for, for over 10 years doing that. This other guys, the idea that none of the law, no, no federal laws apply whatsoever, and that the only reason why state laws apply is because states getting federal funding have to comply with federal law, which wasn't passed. It doesn't make it. It doesn't make any logical sense. So uh, hmm. that's why I'm very skeptical. It, so it has to stand the logical, a logical, a rigorous, rigorous logical inspection. And it first, and it has to stand on its own, whether it's successful in court or not then you can examine the when if you've had success in court or not and be able to determine whether it had something to do with the actual dismissal good point <clears throat> so you're saying that uh this this guy was saying that, that no federal apply, no federal laws are even applicable nothing he, he came on the show and he and 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 he has sent me some documents which i still have to find i i have an envelope here you know so it's somewhere. I feel like a, a real jerk that I, I misplaced it. But his position is that no federal laws have ever passed Congress and been signed by the president into law, that there is literally no federal law. There are bills, uh, which then well, I had asked him, but if, if, if there are no federal laws that apply, why are state cases being done? You know, because that has nothing to do with Congress. They have their own state legislatures. And he says, well, they're not actually charging them under state laws. They're charging them under federal law because they are getting federal funding. I'm like, but federal laws don't apply. Mm. Ah, but because, he says, but yes, but they have to follow the, regula the Code of Federal Regulations because they're taking federal, federal funding. But they're still charging them literally under state codes. But those state codes, it, 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 it's... It's too, it's so convoluted that the more I, I, I you know, I mean, he might be right. Like, you know what I mean? But it doesn't like, make any sense. I mean, does that, I mean, I can't make any sense of that. To me, it sounds, I like Occam's razor. Let the simplest explanation with the fewest or no assumptions is probably correct. And are they men and women? Yeah. What we know is government is provable as men and women without yeah. getting into the Alex Jones garbage. They are men and women. If you cut them, they will bleed. They will die. You know, that's if it bleeds, it dies. Oh, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Uh, so, um, 
We know that's true. We know that there are men and women that are forcing perfect strangers to give them money. That is verifiable. And they'll even correct you and say it's frivolous to say that taxation is voluntary. So it's involuntary. It's coercive. We know that they have a prison system and they use threats of violence, natural violence to get their way. Those are absolute demonstrable facts. Are they forcing their laws on us? Well, we can prove that. It's demonstrably true. So to go into this thing that all this, all these congressional sessions, that they're literally just for show, that they're really not taking votes that mean anything. When, when, when the president signs the bill, it's not really law. It's all literally for show. Is that really more believable than just a group of men and women who are forcing us to pay them and comply with their rules? Which one makes more sense to you? And which one can you absolutely prove? Well, you could definitely prove your, your point of view <clears throat> for, for certain. And the thing is, even in his point of view, this, these, these non-congressional acts that are non-laws I see people every day getting affected by them. So they certainly seem like they're real to me as far as the implementation of them. Now, if he has an argument that's showing why they're not applicable to flesh and blood men and women uh, in whatever different ways, he may, you know, I mean, again, he might have some research that he's, that he's uncovered that shows something. Um, but. Well, he claims to have state department documents that prove that there are no federal laws state I mean, that on its face that claim on its face is is i, I mean that is uh it it, it I, I can't even begin to accept that as a skeptic i i and and he says he sent me the documents and so it's on me yeah it's on me to find that envelope i i'd hate to have i wish he could have just scanned everything and sent it to me it, it's a lot easier to keep track of um, but it, 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 on its face, does it make sense? On its face, does it make sense to say that there are men and women forced, when and women forcing strangers to give the money? Yeah, that's provable. Any, anybody can prove that. that that's logical. It's, it's observable. But this, there are no federal laws and that there is, because it was all for show, it was all fake, literally fake. And since the beginning, this, since the beginning, and there is an actual, there are actual State Department documents that 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 uh, that say that. It's it's like it, that's not even taking something out of context. Like people like to say, well, there is no federal government. It's literally just a corporation, and they quote one section from Title Twenty Eight. Like, but that's limited to certain purposes and certain agencies. And you can go back to 1795. There's a Supreme Court case that I quote in government indicted where I sure it's in there where the United States Supreme Court said, well, the United States government has been and always will be a body politic and a body corporate because as a body corporate, that's how the government operates. So I don't think that's any big revelation there, but it's I think what's important for our own thinking is if you look at them as a private company, if you look at them as a private business and you don't have all that baggage that comes with it that they're represented as then then it's more it's easier to see what's really going on it and it's it, that they're literally so you get past all that crap we were taught yeah mark is, yeah that's right they are just men and women forcing us to pay them well but they represent us. if you force someone to give you money are you actually representing them no i've even had the attorney general's office of california tell me point blank there is no uh, uh, principal agent relationship between the people and the AG's office. Really? Yeah. Of course, they don't like to be, they don't like, to, I mean, uh, you know, they, they don't like to be, well, I guess uh, Tuesday they wouldn't let me record. <laughs> uh, but if there was the principal agent relationship, uh, they wouldn't be, the, you, the only way to have that would be if it was, all, if it was voluntary where uh, support and payment was voluntary like any other business. But to literally force a stranger to give you money, that's not a, bit, that, that's not a principal agent relationship. That, that's a criminal situation there. Right. Well, that, that everybody has just been born into. And so generation after generation doesn't question it. Your dad got his license. 
uh, and, and all his brothers and sisters got their licenses and all your friends got their licenses. When you were getting ready to turn 17, you were excited to get your license, right? So it's just a system that you find yourself immersed in, born into. And then once again, when you start questioning these things, it starts to unravel. And the fact that a judge, like you're saying, a Supreme Court judge couldn't even answer it other than, well, people in the, in the past have gotten locked up. So that's the reasoning. Yeah. In, in, in the context to that again, Greg, is that this was at the ASU law school in Tempe. I did this in front of well over 100 lawyers. Well, I'm mm. assuming they were lawyers. I'm sure that a lot of the audience were lawyers. Mm. And the official position of the Maricopa County, and I have the email to prove this, it's in the video I did with this. Jerry Cobb was the spokesman, but he said in the email, this is the official position of, of the Maricopa County Prosecutor's Office, the county attorney, that the, uh, the laws apply to me because they put other people in prison. They prosecute and put other people in prison. And, you know, again, how, how is that logical? I mean, you know, and it, it, it's not, no. you know, in logic, it's called a non sequitur. Putting other people in prison have nothing to do with whether the laws apply to me. You know, this isn't a matter of, oh, well, it's circumstantial evidence, Mark. Uh, uh, it's like the whole thing about when judges explain about personal knowledge. Now, if, if you go to sleep at night and there's no snow on the ground, <clears throat> But you wake up and there is snow. Now, you didn't personally see it snow, but you can accurately and confidently and, comp and, and you know, cred credibly testify it snowed last night. That's not the same thing when you say that, well, we put other people in prison. That, right. that means that th so this written instrument from 1910, this applies to you because we put other people in prison. So, you know, it's, it's like, well, I, I'm a stickler for logic and, 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 and you're like, well, but wait a minute. If what you're saying is actually true, then the law didn't apply to anybody until after you prosecuted the first unlucky soul. So someone actually said this, an IRS agent actually said this to me. So I'm glad I remember this. You're going to like this. No, it was, it was a state tax agent, not IRS. And he said that the, uh, the 14th Amendment was evidence that the laws applied. 14th Amendment. A lot of people, a lot of people look at it that way. Yeah. And it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. And I, it, it was one of those things, times, Greg, where the stupidity of the response momentarily makes your brain just say, what, what the hell? You are either you're retarded or you're just treating me like I'm, re, you know, half a retard. So I said to him, your position is the 14th Amendment is evidence that the laws apply? Yes. So you always want them to confirm so that they don't say you're taking me out of context. That's not what I said. Right. <laughs> it's like, I asked you and I wrote it down. I told you I was writing it down. You dishonest. So I just followed up. So, so your position is, there was, the laws didn't apply to anybody from 1776 to 1864. Right. What do you mean? You just said the evidence proving the Constitution apply and the laws apply is the 14th Amendment. Yeah. 14th Amendment wasn't passed in 1865. So that logic means, so your position has to be, if you want to continue, the laws didn't apply prior to the 14th Amendment. So then I start to realize, oh, he's not as big of an idiot because he actually questioned. Mm. And, and that's why I recommend being skeptical of all this stuff. My material, of course, there are no opinions or claims or assertions that are immune from being questioned. Hey, uh, 14th Amendment, 1868, I believe, right? I thought it was 18, is it? Or I thought yeah. it was 1865. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I, I guess. believe it was 1868, but I might be okay. wrong, but I think oh. it is. Okay. You, yeah. Well, yeah, it was, well, it was after, okay. It was definitely after, oh, it was after the war. That's okay. So I was thinking 1865, but you, okay. Yeah, you got me. But no, you make a very good point. And I think that it's, 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 it's really interesting, you know, and, uh, 
there's so many aspects. I just had a, a gentleman we spoke to a, a week or two ago, um, and he was showing us Alabama's uh, Senate resolution, blah, 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 from 1956 or something like that, from 19, in the 50s, I believe. And they, uh, their conclusion in Alabama um, Senate resolution was the 14th and 15th Amendment don't, doesn't exist, null and void, right? And that was, that, that was the Alabama, you know, this, there was their, their resolution. So he took this and he says, okay, well, I'm going to utilize this to, and I'm not saying he's wrong, um, but he, his, his assertion was, I'm going to take this now and I'm going to uh, utilize this for, um, I think it was a passport, right? I'm going to use this as evidence that when they ask me, am I a United States citizen, which they're obviously, and I'll say obviously, um, referring to the 14th Amendment citizen at that point, because right, the 14th Amendment was, we, we at least know factually that the 14th Amendment came to give uh, the privilege of citizenship to the African freed slaves. The states weren't, uh, well, it's, well, it had nothing to do with the states at that point. It was just that they, that the congressional record is that the Africans were not United States citizens and they had to both give up the African, uh, African nationality and then voluntarily participate in the American society. So they passed uh, the Expatriation Act right before the 14th Amendment, 14th Amendment, I think it was the day before. Um, needless to say, they, uh, they passed the 14th Amendment for the African freed slaves. And then at that point, from what a lot of people speak about is, everyone went underneath the 14th Amendment. You were a state citizen, right? When the, when the states were created, right? Everyone was a state citizen of the state w w wherein they lived. And then by virtue of being a part of the union, you were a part of the United States of America. And then when the 14th Amendment was passed, the, the federal government made, made this uh, assertion now that first and foremost, you're a United States citizen, and then secondarily, you're a citizen where in the state where you reside. So it flipped the entire system upside down and made it to where you're first a federal citizen, and then secondarily, a citizen of the state where you reside. Whereas initially, it, was, it would be, you're a citizen of the state where you live or where you're born in and then by virtue of being a state citizen you are also considered an american or united states citizen or united states of america citizen um, it was a privileged form of citizenship if you will a franchise if you will of the federal government for the 14th amendment to be ex to be extended to the african freed slaves from from what i understand um, well, I don't know how much of that is fact is historically accurate because a lot of the southern states, especially something like Alabama, were not allowing the the the, the new freely, you know, the slave, the, the 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 former slaves weren't allowing, you know, they were stripping them of state citizenship and not allowing them to vote, and so a lot of this, a big part of the Fourteenth Amendment was so that the newly freed slaves could not be disenfranchised by action of the state. But would it come? But, the, but bottom line, and again, this is not something I discuss in court. But right. among us, uh, there is there, there are no there never was. It was always an illusion. It was always public relations to try to convince people that they were citizens and residents of the state of the United States, because uh, one, it's a big part of taxation. The United uh, Loria, not Loria, uh, uh, Cook v. Tate. Uh, it was a United States Supreme Court case where somebody who was a permanent resident in Mexico, but still considered a citizen, and he wasn't contesting that, he was a permanent resident in Mexico, never intending to return to the United States, was still subject to taxation because of the, re the uh, alleged relationship of a, being a citizen. And I, I, I've done this for years where, which is, again, I don't have to go through this in court. It's because of this that no prosecutor has ever proven that they have a client, that there is a state that they represent, because it is, it is a fiction, of course. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the outside of court, they'll at least admit that. It's in their own books. But, uh, it, you know, corporation is a figment of legal imagination. That's the Supreme Court. Exactly. So, uh, you know, because to have a citizen... A citizen is a member of the body politic, owing a duty of allegiance and return for duty protection, each a consideration for the other. Now, that is what Loria versus United States said. And uh, the presumption of, of citizenship is, is the basis of federal taxation. It's, it, they're taxing the relationship and the presumption that the government is there to protect the citizen. That's that allegiance and protection. 
Right. Well, we all know, especially it came out recently, this is nothing new or exclusive to me, uh, Scott Peterson, not the one from California, but the one from the Parkland shooting, that deputy, he did not go in to help those children that were in, in the, uh, the you know, hey, government employees. He did not go in as a sheriff's deputy who was there for security. Right. His job was, and, and so he's now arguing that, it, that he had no duty to protect. And he's going to win. Because forcing, two th you know, forcing people to give you money does not create obligations of allegiance and protection. So there could, so, and they openly state that there is no duty to protect. So if there, if the only thing that made somebody a citizen was allegiance and protection, a duty of protection, and those obligations and uh, duties don't exist, then nobody's a citizen and there is no body politic, there is no government, there are no state, the whole thing comes collapsing down, which is why when we go into court, and I don't do this anymore, but uh, it's a fun fun thing to do is to ask the prosecution to prove he has a client and just taking a bar card out doesn't prove you have a client any half idiot uh, get, but they know the judge is backing them up and they know there's no way in the world they're going to be able, I look just like I went through to prove that there's a state you have to prove that there are citizens and the only way to prove that there are citizens you have to prove that there are uh, 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 enforceable duties of allegiance and protection and you can't do that why because they're perfect strange they're, they're, they're men and women forcing perfect strangers to give them money and forcing someone to give you money doesn't create the obligations so that's I was what, trying to actually be brief there, so but no, I was great. That was well said. <laughs> well, that that was very well said. Hey, let's let's uh let's get off of uh, immediate courtroom and all that stuff, and let's get, have some fun. Tell tell us tell us where uh how'd you get into law? Oh, geez, you want to? Um, I actually was in a union back in Long Island, and I ran a uh, I ran a, a detail shop on uh, Route One Twelve in Medford, in Long Island, and okay. I was making a nice dollar. I was doing well, and I also had my own, I did it on the side, tax-free, I might add. And um, I, I was uh, unceremoniously fired, and they hired somebody, so I was on flag time. They wanted to, they fired me to put somebody on salary so they could pay them, you know, a lot less. So uh, flag time is you get paid by the job, not by, you know, okay. so the job, that's why mechanics who do brake jobs at high end places will make so much money just doing brakes because let's say the brake job, they make, uh, let's say $20 an hour and the brake job, uh, uh, you know, they get paid for an hour and a half. They do the job in half an hour. Mm. So you can, you know, so I wound up uh, using the union rep to and a lawyer to challenge this and it looked like i was going to win because they pulled something out of thin air they're saying well you're supposed to have 180 days before this kicks in and and we only count working day i'm like come on this is bull so anyway i lost that i went up uh, the lawyer told me to go uh abba fangul he wasn't going to help me appeal it so i wound up doing the appeal myself and that's how i got into it and and what really and so i had this brief done and it was i was it was great and I was really happy. And so I get there and it turns out that uh, the, the court on, was on 112 down the street from the dealerships. And the owner of the building, uh, owner of the dealerships owned the building the court was in. <laughs> now you see where I'm going. So this is, this is what happened. So I, I prepped for six months or so learning all this stuff. Labor law, by the way. Mm. New York labor law. So let's not forget, bad. And um, I get there and, and the lawyers for the company show up and, and uh, the judge says, uh, I, uh, I have, uh, I've read the, uh, the documents and I'm going to affirm the decision. Have a nice day. In and out like that. And I just, and so they all left and I was standing there like an idiot, like what the hell just happened? And that was my, that was my, my, you know, entrance into the, the, the this faux legal system. Right. And, 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 and look, and to be honest, I've mentioned this before. I hate bullies. I hated high school. I was called a faggot every day. I still to this day don't know why well, I was singled out. And, you know, it was like, I thought faggot was my middle name after a while, you know? Uh, I hate bullies. 
And that's one of the reasons why after being disillusioned about the legal system and, and, and started going, uh, I, I hate bullies. I, and, uh, so yes, I like to take them down a notch. And so that's part of my motivation for doing this. Hmm. Tell, tell me your, uh, your favorite story of a, a courtroom experience. And uh, I don't know, just tell me the, your favorite experience. I'm sure there's some, some, some wild prosecutor uh, looks on their faces, but I want to hear, hear your favorite. You know, there was one, it was in Blythe, California. And it was, it was, I wasn't even an anarchist at the time. I was more of the, you know, because we start out as minarchist and, and see the light. And it was, it was a franchise tax board hearing. And they have what's called an anti-injunctive tax act. And it prohibits, in most cases, there, there is an exception. They don't like to accept this, though. And you're not, just like the federal level, you can't, the courts have no jurisdiction to hear a tax case that interferes with the collection of the tax. That's why it's called the Anti-Injunctive Tax Act. If you can show that there's a due process violation and they can't prevail on any circumstances, then, then you, can, you can get over that. So we had a judge and we're watching him because uh, you know, we were one of the last ones called that morning. And they had called in someone from the AG's office from Sacramento that flew down to Blythe, California for this. So they brought out the big guns for me. I don't know why. But. And they were arguing the Anti-Injunctive Tax Act, that this is a tax case. I argued, and the judge was just, tell me the facts. Sir, just give me the facts. And I said, this is not a tax case. This is a property case and a due process case. They are trying to take his property under the guise of the tax laws, which they can't show of any application here. They have no evidence whatsoever. And the judge understood the facts because we laid out the facts because we had spoken with agents. That's what I like to do is we, we know I'd like to call and talk to the agents and use their own statements against them. So I use their own admissions in court. So when I've got a judge who's only interested in the facts, that's great. So, uh, and we knew we were off to a pretty good start because I wasn't initially speaking for the guy, and, but he started stuttering. So I just started talking because I, I, I had a bail. I, I could let him, he was going to, he was going to burn again. Right. Again, they brought in a ringer. This, this woman was, was tough. And so the, the judge said, uh, excuse me, who are you? I, I said, well, I'm the next friend and I'm assisting. Oh, okay. Go on. Wow. This is cool. Uh, so the judge was saying to the, she, he said to the, uh, AG, she, she, he said, look, are you willing to call your boss in Sacramento and, and voluntarily stop proceeding against this man? So I don't have to do this. She says, absolutely not. I am. No. And so the judge says, answer me this. Do you have evidence to prove a, she said, well, no. Do you have evidence to prove this? No. Do you have any facts to prove this? She said, no. She said, well, you leave me no choice, ma'am. I don't want to do this. I have no choice. You have no evidence. I'm holding that the Anti-Injunctive Tax Act does not bar the action, and I'm going to grant the uh, temporary restraining order against the Franchise Tax Board. Wow. And, and this is the icing on the cake. This is why it's one of my favorite. Because I called the guy and I said, did you get the, because you know, I said, after we left, you get that transcript. <laughs> I got to have a proof of this. All right. And so he calls me and he says, I have good news. I got bad news. I, I just had the performance of my life at the time. This is like 99. Okay. And uh, I said, oh my gosh. All right. What's, what, what's the bad news? He says, dude, there's no transcript. And I just, you know, I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me, right? You got to be kidding. I said, but there's good news. He says, yeah, <laughs> it's on video. Oh, oh. Wow. <laughs> so I haven't digitized it yet. I have to be able to, again, it's, I have to even dig it out, but that's one of my favorite. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. That was one of my favorite. I, Cause I am one of the few people, I probably the only lay person who's ever got a restraining order against the franchise tax board. That's amazing. <laughs> so that, you said that was, 90, that was 99? I was 98 or 99, yeah. I was still 
fairly green, but sure. I, I, I knew enough to stick to the facts. Yeah. And you know, that's why I loved watching the follow-up to Making a, Making a Murder on Netflix. And I highly recommend it because she goes through a lot of the evidentiary process and Brady violations. Mm. And uh, Zellner, very good attorney. She has uh, gotten a lot of people who were falsely convicted out. She's got 17 people out. Now, totally innocent. And one of the things she said, and I think she's absolutely right, and she says, when you go into court, you damn what you have better make sure that you know the facts better than anybody else. Yeah. Makes sense. That, yeah. You better know the context. You better know the facts. You, and, and it goes to like, if you're going to ask a question, you better, if it's not a leading question, especially not a leading question. If you ask an open ended question, you should only do it knowing the answer. Otherwise, you don't want to do that, but you should know the facts, you know, well, and, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, and don't accept the sacred cow. It's one of the things I talked about last night on the show. Uh, this is, and I know I'm running a long on time, three things you, you want to attack. The accuser's premise is accusation. You don't want to give any of their accusations or claims a free pass. There are no sacred cows and you've got to hit them where they breathe. You've got to go with the foundation. Now, lawyers will say the first two, man, you're right on the money. Any half idiot would, would yeah. but when you get to number three and you say the foundation of the prosecution's case is that the laws apply. Remember, they're making that accusation. Right. And there's a no, oh, you, you got to accept that. Oh, so when you said not to give them a free pass, you didn't mean it. Very important. Don't let them off the hook. Well said. Very well said. Um, when did you, uh, let me look at the time real quick. All right. We just got a few minutes left. Um, when, when did you get into, uh, deciding that you were an anarchist? How long ago do you feel? Oh gosh, that was right around, you know, around 2002, 2000, I just couldn't resolve certain, uh, contradictions. Yeah. And I, uh, no, I guess it was maybe 2001 or so. And what, I was having trouble resolving these contradictions. And, uh, and then someone I know had a copy of Lysander Spooner's No Trees in the Constitution, No Authority. And, 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 and that just took care of the contradictions. And like, you know, cause it was one of those things where I was much younger and, and I was like on an island here, you know, cause I had realized with the no citizenship that there is no government, there is no state. Uh, and I was at the time, well, that's because it got corrupted, you know, and I was the only one I was catching a lot of heat from well-established patriot types like Mr. You know, Granzy up in Minnesota. And then finding a spooner was just like, boom, oh my gosh. And so if anyone has not read No Trees in the Constitution, No Authority, get it. It's online for free. The Santa Spooner wrote it over a hundred years ago. Uh, brilliant expose on and, and that there never was a legitimate government uh, and why it just so yeah I, I would say yeah damn it 20 years ago so I'll nice. date myself a little bit there nice I'll try to leave if I could if I could remember I'll try to leave a link um, in the description um, on the YouTube channel for Lysander's uh, Spooner's well, there's a PDF somewhere on, online right there's, there's many uh, sites if you're able to tolerate my, uh, my Long Island these, then <laughs> I have the whole thing as an audio book. Okay. No way. Yeah, I, well, I was learning how to do Audacity and how to edit. That's fantastic. So I figured what better way than to yeah. do, yeah, so it killed two birds with one stone, so. Good for you, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna leave links in the description for the folks to be able to visit you, but why don't you go ahead and tell them um, out loud all the different sites and what the names are and where they can find you online. Uh, MarkStevens.net, the information for the No State Project is on the site. All the material is there. Uh, if you want consultation, everything is available uh, on, you know, there on the, the store. The show is twice a week, commercial free on Wednesday on my YouTube channel. And then uh, also the LRN stream is on Saturday, which I also stream live on, uh, on the YouTube channel. So no state project. Fantastic. Everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mark Stevens from uh, no state project and adventures in legal land. We really appreciate you coming out tonight, brother and talking to us. Uh, yeah. Prego. 
Galaxy and uh, Faison. We'll have to do it again. Sure, I'd love to. Awesome. Have a great night, Mark. Thanks. You too. All right. Peace, brother.